I'm sure we're all very familiar with the squiggly red lines that appear under misspelled words when we're typing away at an essay or an email. But have you ever stopped to wonder how such a feature is implemented? I mean, sure, it's a simple feature that we probably rarely think about, but believe it or not, it's all thanks to an incredibly brilliant algorithm working under the hood to help keep our communication clear and professional. The genesis of spell checking systems can be traced back to the late 1950s and early 1960s, notably with the pioneering concepts of Herbert Glantz in 1957 and the subsequent development by Charles Blair in 1960. Their idea was simple. Each word typed by a user was compared against a list of correctly spelled words, flagging those not found in the list. Though they lacked the ability to actually suggest correct spellings, these were crucial first steps for spell checking technology. This early work set the stage for a significant advancement in the early 1970s when Ralph Gorin developed a more sophisticated program known as Spell. Ralph's program was a major advancement over its predecessors. While it still identified misspelled words, it also suggested a list of plausible correct spellings. Words considered plausible were those with an edit distance of 1, meaning the difference could be a single letter insertion, a single letter deletion, or a substitution of one letter for another. Ralph published his program in 1971, making it publicly available and quickly spreading its use worldwide. At the time, this was an incredibly useful program and was a massive leap in spell checking technology, but there was only one glaring problem. Not all spelling errors would have only one edit distance. While this remarkable achievement certainly deserves recognition, it's important to acknowledge that there was still potential for further enhancing spell checkers. We needed to find a way to calculate plausible words that are beyond one edit distance. But how do we even quantify edit distance? Well, luckily, at this time, an algorithm had already been discovered to do just this. Just six years prior, in 1965, Soviet scientist Vladimir Levenstein published his famous Levenstein distance algorithm. While it wasn't initially designed for spell checking, this would soon be the missing piece of the puzzle to further the development of spell checkers. Now, I know this looks like a jarbled mess of confusion at first, but we're going to step through it to show that it's actually quite simple and elegant. To demonstrate, I'm going to use it to find the edit distance from the word hat to can. And just like Ralph Gorin's program, we can pick from only one of three edit moves, which are deletion, insertion, or a combination of the two, substitution. Now you can probably intuitively guess that the edit distance between these two words is just two. I mean, we just substitute H with C and substitute T with N. And you're correct, it is in fact two. So let's keep that in mind so that we can check the answer of this algorithm. So to start, let's plug in our two words into the algorithm. Now, starting with our first conditional, if the length of can is zero, we return the length of hat. Well, the length of can is not zero, so we move on. Similar condition here, just the words are swapped. The length of hat is not zero, so we move on. Our next conditional says that if the head of hat is equal to the head of can. In other words, is the first letter of these two words the same? And they're not, so we move on. Now that we've essentially gone through the guard clauses of this algorithm, we now know that a move must be performed. So we add one to our edit distance. Next, let's clean up what we have here in these square brackets. And you'll see here that we have three possible routes we can take. We can delete a letter, insert a letter, or we can substitute a letter. Since we don't know which of these is the best route, we run all three of them recursively and choose the route that returns the smallest edit distance. Since we were able to intuitively solve this earlier, we know that our first move is substitution. So let's follow that route. Again, we go through our guard clauses. The length of AN is not zero, so we move on. The length of AT is not zero, so we move on. Next, we get to this conditional. If the head of AT is equal to the head of AN, which it is because they both start with the letter A, so here, we don't perform any move since they both have the same letter, and hence, we don't add anything to our running edit distance. Let's simplify this call to the function again. So now, we're inputting the tail of AT and the tail of AN, which is just T and N. So going through this once more, the length of N is not zero, so we move on. The length of T is not zero, so we move on. The head of T is not equal to the head of N, so we move on. So now we know a move must be performed, so let's add another one to our edit distance. Again, we've got three possible routes to take. 
you'll see that when I clean up these inputs, each of these routes has at least one empty string as an input, which in the next recursive call would get handled by these conditionals. If we were to perform all three of these, we would get one, one, and zero. And we take the minimum of those, which is zero. So there we have it. Using a Levenstein distance algorithm, we were able to calculate the edit distance from hat to can. That wasn't so bad, right? Except it kind of is. Looking again at this algorithm, remember we're calling the function recursively three times every iteration. This gives us a time complexity of big O of three to the nth power. Can you imagine the amount of recursion involved when computing the edit distance between longer words? It's incredibly inefficient. But to Levenstein's credit, he didn't initially formulate this algorithm to be used as a computer program. It was more of a mathematical concept. Now, earlier, I noted that this algorithm was developed six years prior to Ralph Gorin's program. I had asked myself while doing research for this video why Ralph decided not to use Levenstein's distance algorithm when creating his program. I could only really speculate that either he was unaware of Levenstein's distance algorithm at the time, or the more likely scenario is the fact that the Levenstein distance algorithm requires significant processing power and memory due to its recursive nature, so it's not a practical algorithm to implement programmatically. That was until 1974 when Robert Wagner from Vanderbilt University and Michael Fisher from MIT introduced a groundbreaking solution to the inefficiency of the Levenstein distance algorithm. Instead of relying on the intensive recursive calls that characterize Levenstein's approach, Wagner and Fisher utilize the technique known as dynamic programming, which involves breaking down a complex problem into simpler subproblems solving each of these subproblems just once and storing their solutions. By doing this, the algorithm avoids the excessive repetitive work seen in Levenstein's recursive approach. To demonstrate this elaborate solution, I'm going to find the edit distance from boats to float. Now, to break this problem down into smaller subproblems, the Wagner-Fisher algorithm suggests adding these words to a matrix like so. This will allow us to determine the edit distance between substrings and build off those calculations as we go. So again, the edit steps we can perform are deletion, insertion, and substitution. Okay, so first, starting with this top left cell, we're asking ourselves which of these operations must we perform to transform this empty string into an empty string? Well, none, so we put a zero here. Next, we ask what operation must be performed to transform an empty string to the string f. We would use insertion here to insert an f. So that's one operation, so we put a one here. Moving on, what operations are needed to transform an empty string to this string fl? That would be two insertion operations. And you'll see that we can build off our previous calculation. If it took one insertion to go from an empty string to F, then it only requires one more insertion operation to get FL. So we put two here. Same with transforming an empty string to FLO, three insertion operations. So we put a three here. And you can probably see that as we keep going across this first row, it's just one additional insertion operation until we get to the end. Okay, so next, let's fill out this first column. Going from the string B to an empty string takes one deletion operation this time, so we put one here. Next, to go from the string BO to an empty string, again, just like before, we can work off our previous calculations. If it took one deletion operation to get from B to an empty string, it would only take one additional deletion operation to go from BO to an empty string. And again, the same pattern appears, we can just fill out the rest of this column following suit. And in fact, this will always be the case with the first row and column always being filled like this. Okay, so now let's get on to the meat of this matrix. Here, we're asking ourselves what operation must be performed to transform B to F. In this case, we use one substitution operation. Since we're substituting, we build off the value that is diagonal in the top left of this cell. So we add one to zero, so we insert a one here. Okay, now we need to determine how many operations are needed to transform B to FL. But instead of sitting here and thinking about which operations we should use, what we're gonna do instead is look at these three cells. All we need to do is take the minimum value of these three cells and add one to it. So here we take one and add one to get two. So we can use this trick to just continue filling out the rest of the matrix. 
Except you gotta be careful when you get to a scenario like this where both letters are the same. No operation is needed when they are the same. So here we just take the minimum value and don't add anything to it. So two is the minimum value, so we use that. Okay, so now once the table is filled out, we can look at this final value here in the bottom right corner, and that is our edit distance to get from boats to float. We can even use this matrix to determine the operations that were used to transform them. So from this bottom right cell, which cell next to it is the smallest value? Well, it's this two above it, which means we delete the S from the end of boats. The next smallest valued cell here is the two just diagonal from it. The value is still two because no operation was performed here because you'll notice that both strings had a T in this position. The same thing here, both strings have an A in this position, so the next smallest cell is diagonal. So we can jump to it without performing any operation. And again, same idea with this O. Now at this point, we could go one of two ways. Here, I'm going to jump left and perform an insertion of L. And finally, we jump to the last cell to perform a substitution to replace the B with an F. And so yeah, there we have it. So you can probably see how this is a much more efficient way of calculating the edit distance between two strings. And it's simple enough to be implemented programmatically. To demonstrate, I've created a Python script that implements the Wagner-Fisher approach so that we can compute the edit distance between two words. So here, I can input a misspelled word, and the script computes the edit distance of that misspelled word against each word in a massive dictionary of correctly spelled words, and it returns a list of words that have the smallest edit distance. So if this were used in a spell checker, these are the words that would get recommended to me. Now, sure, this is still an inefficient method for a spell checker. I mean, you're telling me that as a spell checker, it takes each word that's typed and computes its edit distance to every word in a dictionary? There's clearly some improvements that can be made from here, like maybe don't compute the edit distance immediately, maybe check to see if the word exists in the dictionary to see if it's spelled correctly first before computing its edit distance to other words. Maybe the dictionary should be pre-sorted in some way. You can imagine where spell checkers went from here. Popular programs like WordCheck and Microsoft Word in the 80s and 90s utilized more evolved and optimized versions of these algorithms. Fast forwarding to today, as you can imagine, many modern spell checkers now incorporate techniques such as natural language processing to understand context of the sentence in order to suggest more appropriate word corrections. If you're interested in playing around with this Wagner-Fisher algorithm, I've uploaded this Python script to my GitHub linked below. I encourage you to find a way to continue optimizing the solution. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like, and if you enjoyed content like this, hit that subscribe button, and consider checking out some of my other content. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video.